Good morning, good morning, good morning. Are you glad to be here today with everybody in the house? Yes, awesome, awesome. You notice we put out a lot more chairs and we got just kind of packed out today, so um, so it gives us a good shot. We got people outside working. Make sure you see those people. You just give them a high five. Tell them thank you for serving. They're out there getting everything prepared so we can have a great time. So after service, we're going to have tacos, and Pastor Angela and I uh, have cooked these for you, and <laughs> for sure we did, and we actually cooked them for you, and they're actually really good. So, and so we want you to stay and have some tacos with us, and we're just going to have a great time with the kids on water slides and all the fun stuff that we're going to be doing. Um, before I get started too f- here, I want Jay Kelly to stand back there. Why don't you come up here, Jay, real quick? Come on, come on, come on. He told me not to do this, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, come on. This is Mr. Jay Kelly. So glad to have you. Yeah, stand down there so I'll be almost as tall as you. And uh, Jay is running for mayor for our city, and so I just wanted to introduce him. He's going to be hanging her out uh, around outside, so if you want to stop by and shake his hand and see what... Oh, Mr. J, he's really Pastor J. He's a preacher too. So, uh, we, we, so, so uh, we're just super excited about God uniting our city, uniting our people. And so Jay's here today. So you want to meet him? Just uh, do so. All right, all right. Thank you, Jay. Uh, I want uh, Jeff and Stephanie Adcock to come up real quick, real quick. Where are they at? I know I saw them in the house somewhere. There they come. All right, we're not going to cry because we're going to rejoice because God has blessed this man of God, um, and uh, he has served in our church for, I don't know, 14 14 years, (laughs) 14 years, and so um, come over here, Stephanie, I'm going to separate you just a minute, come over here. Stephanie is also just taught our kids, she was our children's pastor, Jeff uh, they, they ran a route and, and picked up kids and brought them to church. They've loved on the inner city kids. They had just done it all around here. And their kids are like my kids, and my kids are like their kids. They have. <laughs> <laughs> they, uh, she has taught my kids to read. And um, so she's just been a big part of our lives. Hannah, stop crying. <laughs> and so... But uh, God has blessed this man and guy with a, a, a new job and a new location in, um, in uh, South Carolina. And so this is his last Sunday with us, and uh, he may be back in and out. But we just want to bless them. You know what? We love to celebrate when God raises people to another level, even though sometimes it don't feel good because you want, don't want them to go. But, you know, we believe God opens doors. And uh, we're, we're not a saving church, meaning we're just saving you for everything because God wants you spent. And so there's surely something God wants to do with them in South Carolina. And so we don't want to just send them to a new job, but we want to send them into a field of ministry. Amen. So I, I want some of our prayer team to come, uh, my wife to come, and we're going to pray over them and uh, just love on them and bless them as we send them out out into the field. I think you girls should come up and pray with me. Come on. Come on, my three amigos here. Come on up. One of them's in the nursery. One of them's in the nursery. Let's pray. Father, we just thank you, Lord, for Jeff and Stephanie and their children and their grandchildren. Lord, we thank you, God, for all the blessings that they've poured out in this house. The many years they have served here, the many years they have given their all, God. And so, God, today we just get to send them out, Lord. We send them into a new mission field, into a new place, into a new region, God. And I just pray this will be a refreshing time as they go to the mountains, Lord. We know God's in the mountains. And so we just pray, God, as they go to the mountains that they will uh, be able to just... uh, change the world that's around them and so today we just love on them we bless them we pray god we just, you just pour out many many financial blessings and everything else god on their life to help them to prosper god and to live in that place of the supernatural and we thank you for it in jesus name and everybody said amen, amen. amen. i love you man i love you i love you awesome give me a hug oh, i love you so much all right, God bless. Whoo! All right. Yeah. Oh, Pastor Angel, come back up here. I know a lot of times we have a full house like this, and we have people, a lot of people don't know who my wife is. 
Uh, matter of fact, there's been a lot of times because Michelle's so up here giving announcements and doing things. A lot of people thought Michelle's my wife. That would not work. One of us would die. <laughs> so uh, she's awesome, but she's not my wife. This is my wife, uh, Pastor Angela. And uh, I want to honor her today, love on her. And, uh, and so she's, she, as someone said it well, even this morning, that she serves. And a lot of times you won't see her because she'll be in the kitchen or in the back room or doing something of that nature. But uh, she's been on stage for many years, and, and her son-in-law kicked her off the worship team. I'm just kidding. That's not really what happened. We just joke about that at home. But I just wanted to say I love you and thank you for partnering with me and pastor in this church because you wouldn't want me to pastor without her I can assure you so how many came yesterday to our serve Saturday come on if you missed it you missed a great time I got a couple of picks from that I want to talk about do you have those picks yeah 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 come on shoot look look at our team right here we were all did the luau thing but there's do you have one of the the uh you have another one yeah, limbo, limbo. Yeah, that's what we did yesterday. We did the limbo, and I'll tell you what, I was amazed at some of the people that did the limbo. I don't see him in the room right now. I think he's outside working or stepped next door, but Richard Bro scared me to death. <laughs> I, honest to God, I thought, I thought, is he really going to do this? And he, I, I kind of lifted the limbo stick and said, go on before we have to go to the hospital. <laughs> But we had such an incredible fun time yesterday, and, uh, and we, ha we love to serve, and we love the heart of serving. And, and it's not just uh, something that we do because it's work to do. It's because we as a family have fun doing it. And so if you're not on a serve team, you probably want to get on one because you don't want to miss serve Saturdays if nothing else. And so it was a great time. Great time. We had a great time. So I'm going to talk about a few things today. I'm not going to be extremely long today, but I want to talk about core values and the power of core values. Over the last few weeks, we've been talking about how to have peace in the midst of a storm. You know, just living in, we live in a chaotic world, but God, get, he's the giver of peace, and we can stand in the chaos and have peace in our heart and have a relationship with God that supersedes the chaos around us. How many believe that? That's good. And so, and then, and then what did we talk about the second week? Does anybody remember? Come on. A double-minded man is unstable in all of his ways. And that's man or woman, by the way. And so uh, being double-minded and what that looks like. And then last week, what did we talk about? Anybody remember? Renewing the mind. Huh? Renewing the mind. Renewing the mind. How to renew your mind. How to have a tr live in a mind that's transformed by the power of God. How many know that you can't just transform your own mind? You need Jesus to help you with that. Can I get a better amen? You need the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And so today I'm going to be talking about core values. Next week I'm going to be talking about spiritual warfare, how to win the battle, how to overcome. And so, uh, but today I'm going to be talking about core values. And it's so important that somebody said uh, maybe core values is uh, it's talking about our, our series this month on mind games. But if we don't have core values in our life, then we're, we're like a ship that's adrift. And so core values are very, very important. They're like an anchor in our life to keep us uh, where we need to be. And so I, I want to explain to you a few things about that today. And so what is, what is core values and why do we need them in our life? What is core values and why do we need them in our life? A core value is the fundamental belief of a person. And here's what I want to say to you today. Everybody in this place has a belief system. Everybody. Now, it may, but if you're not intentional about your belief system, then you will pick up, Scripture talks about every wave or wind of doctrine or every new thing that comes along. How many know that in our society, with Internet and all that, that there's something new every single day that can capture your mind? It can capture your thoughts. And so we have to have these core values in our life that are, that are unmovable, then that we, don't, we don't drift away from these core values. They're a part of our very fiber. And so it's important to know what we believe. These guide the principles, and direct, these guiding principles direct your behavior. And understanding the difference between what is right and what is wrong. I never would have thought that I would have ever said this, but at nearly 55, I'll be 55 in a couple of weeks, at nearly 55, I honestly believe that people today don't know right from wrong. 
I thought I would never say that. I've always said, well, people know right from wrong. They choose to do differently. Honestly, I think the world is so confusing and so much stuff coming at us that people don't know right from wrong. And so when you have core values in your life, they are the guiding principles that teach us right from wrong. And, and it's, it's a pattern that we can follow. Core values help us determine if you are on the right path and fulfilling the goal that God created you for. And, and when God creates you for something, there ought to be some guiding things in your life that are unwavering, that you don't change. You don't change because something new comes along or something exciting comes along. But these are core principles, core values in your life. And, and you filter every single thing in your life through these core values. So I want you to uh, picture this with me this morning. So you have a funnel. And that funnel has its core values at the, like a screen at the top of it. And so all, everything that you do in life is filtered through that screen, that paradigm of core values. You know what you're going to receive out of that when you, get, when you have a funnel like that? You're going to receive the purpose that God planned for your life. But when you don't have a filter and you don't have core values in your life, that means everything gets an opportunity to go into your life. Things that you, you really don't want in your life are, are filtered into your life. And so we, with, this, with this funnel, we funnel out, we screen out the things that are not supposed to be a part of our life. And so we know right off the bat that in this core value that I have, that this doesn't belong. I was teaching my kids how to drive, and, and each one of them I t t teach how to drive. And, 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 and I think everybody does, but I only raise girls. So girls, you know, they, they're looking mostly at what's right immediately in front of them. So they're paying attention to a 20 feet or 30 feet in front of them. And so as I taught them how to drive, I taught them, like, don't, don't think about what's right in front of you all the time. Think about what's down the road. So when you get to an intersection, you're not making a decision whether you're going to go left or right. You've already made that decision. You already have a plan for your life. You already have a plan for where you're driving. And you're already in the left lane if you're turning left. Or you're already in the right lane if you're turning right. Now, Heather had a little, was a little slow getting to that, as smart as she is. And, and we were, I remember one time we were at, in, in the middle of that traffic right there in front of Target and Covington. And if you've ever been right there on those six or eight lanes, it's like crazy, all right? And so Heather is a very decisive person. She really is. And so you know what she did? She stopped in the road to make a decision. And I was screaming, just go anywhere, but don't stop. Just go. We can turn around, we can come back, but we can't stop. We can't stop. She does a little better than that. Sometimes lights and stop signs don't mean a whole lot to her. But other than that, if you see the little white forerunner coming, just make room. So... Um, so, but core values are those things that we've already made a decision about where we're going, what we're doing, and what is and what is not going to be a part of my life. Everybody say, that's good. So we have to maintain a standard of excellence that allows us to grow in every area of our life that creates a culture in which we live. Creates a culture in which we live. As we, uh, as a church, have core values that guide us, and I, today I want to share about 10 of the core values. When we write down all the things that we love about our house and we work as a team, and we, last year we was, we was processing through some of this. We came up with 22 different things, but I'm not going to give you 22. I kind of consolidated them into 10 today, but I want to help you to understand the core values of our house but before I do, I want you to take a little minute. There's this on your seat is a list of these core values. And on the back, it's blank. And there's a reason it's blank on the back, not because we just want it to be blank, but I want you to also be thinking about, as I teach today, what are my personal core values? What are my personal core values? Because if you don't have personal core values, then you're pro you probably... Uh, have struggle making some decisions that should already be made. And so you might want to, as we go through these things, you might want to adopt some of, of, of these values that I'm talking about and say, not only is that going to be the value of my house, that I, the church that I attend, but this is going to be a value of my everyday life. 
I'm going to make this a value of my everyday life. And of course, most of these values should be a part of your everyday life. So they should be intertwined. But then I want to also encourage you to do something. Uh, I, I have personally, and I thought about this this morning, so I'm going to confess as I encourage. I thought about every family should have core values. Now, I think that our family has core values because I watch my kids respond to those values uh, in different ways, but I know that they know what our core values are. But you know what? I don't think we've ever sat down and wrote down and said, these are our one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight core values. So we're going to do that when we get home. And, and I want to encourage you to do that also for your family. Write down your core values. And you might want to just take these core values and say, these are going to be our core values for our house, and we're going to add some things to it. But I've handed this out to you today to put it in your Bible, pray over it, and then I want you to know. But these are the core values of the harbor, so I want to share them with you today. Number one, we have a good father, and he's crazy in love with us. Come on, everybody. We have a really good dad, and he's really in crazy in love with us. He loves us with this amazing love. And, and when I talk about the love of the Father, I, I can't help but get just tearful because I, I'm so blown away how much our Father loves us. And I'm going to tell you, the greatest revelation I've ever had in my walk with God was the, how much the Father loves me. Because everything in my life, the Father's love, everything in my life is based on that. It's founded on that. Everything I do, everything I say, everywhere I go, every part of my life is founded on how much my Father loves me. And I, I want to say this today. I love you and you love me. I love my wife. My wife loves me most of the time. And I just want to say that, that that's all awesome. But none of that supersedes Papa's love. Because daddy loves me even when I'm a knucklehead. Daddy loves me even when I've made mistakes. Daddy loves me on the mountaintop. He loves me in the valley. He loves me when I'm broke. He loves me when I got a little bit of money. He loves me when I'm happy. He loves me when I'm sad. His love is not conditional. So powerful. And he's got a crazy kind of love that I really can't even articulate as many times as I tried. So Romans 8, 28. I need some water. So we are convinced that every detail of our life is continually woven together to fit into God's perfect plan of bringing good into our lives. Come on, ain't that good? And we are his lovers who have been called to fulfill his design purpose. For he knew all about us as we were born, and he destined us for the, from the beginning to share in the likeness of his son. This means the son is the oldest among a vast family of brothers and sisters who will become just like him having determined that our destiny ahead of having determined our destiny ahead of time he called us to himself and transferred his perfect righteousness yes. into everyone he called come on yes. so and those who possess his perfect righteousness he co-glorified with his son yes. i talked about this a little bit last week we are seated with christ in heavenly places come on church Come on, we're not orphans, but we have a great dad. Come on, let's give the Lord a shout of praise for that. We're presence-driven. We don't just have this on our wall. We believe in the presence of God. We're presence-driven. Everything is centered around the presence of God, and we live a life of worship, and we host the presence of God. Our worship is not something we just do here on Sunday morning. But our worship becomes our lifestyle, and we host the presence of God. I hope that when I walk into the coffee shop, or I'm in the grocery store, I'm at the hospital, or I'm on my job, or wherever I'm at, at my home, I'm hosting the presence of God. We practice, we live out, and we pursue the presence of God. And we believe that everything that God has for us comes out of that place. Psalms 27 and 4 says, here's one thing that I crave from God, the one thing that I seek above all else. I want the privilege of living with him every moment in his house, finding the sweetness, loveness of his face, filled with awe, filled with awe, always just, God, you're so good, delighting in his glory and grace, and I want to live my life so close to him that he takes pleasure in my every prayer. Come on, how many knows that the Lord takes pleasure in the moment that you whisper his name? 
Why? Because we're hosting the presence of God. And we are the temple of God. We've invited the presence of God into our life. We've invited the Holy Spirit into our life. And he lives in us, and we are carriers of his presence. Number three, family. Because we're sons and daughters, we want to live and love like family. And to create a strong environment for family to be healthy, growing in their relationship with God and with one another. When I talk about family today, I'm talking primarily today about our house and about you, our family. We're going to get to share today some time together in fellowship. But I'm also talking about your family. God wants you to have a healthy, growing, God-centered, purpose-filled life. Romans 8, 15 says, and, and, <clears throat> and you did not receive the spirit of religious duty, leading you back into the fear and never being good enough, but you have received the spirit of full acceptance, acceptance enfolding into you the family of God, and you will never feel orphaned. For as he has raised up with us, our spirit joins him in saying the words of tender affection, beloved father. For the Holy Spirit makes God's fatherhood real to us as he whispers unto our innermost being, and you are God's beloved child. I want you to look over at your neighbor and say, hey, brother, hey, sister, what's up? You my brother, you my sister, we one big family. Come on, we're one big family. I'm loving you. Listen, when you hurt, I hurt. When you cry, I cry. When you rejoice, I rejoice. We're all God's family. Amen. Listen, I'm going to just preach a minute right here. When you're broke, come see me. I, I can help you. All right. When you need food, this, this is a, we want to be a book of Acts church and have an apostolic anointing on our life. We have to also be a book of Acts church when it comes to family. And that means helping one another, serving one another, giving our life for one another, and, and helping create an environment that is positive and purposed around the kingdom of God. The word. The Word has the final authority. It's the infallible truth. The Word of God brings understanding of who God is and who He has created us to be. And we walk in the grace and the freedom because we understand the Word of God. Listen, I'm going to just say this real quick. It's not in my notes this morning, but I want to say this. When you're reading the Word of God, I always pray when I'm reading the Word of God, God, let the Holy Spirit bring revelation to what you're speaking off these pages. I don't have my Bible up here with me this morning, but I can just tell you that a, a Bible can be as little as a textbook without the Holy Spirit speaking to you. You need more than just the words off the pages, but you need the revelation of who he is that's written in between the lines that you receive from reading the word of God. That's really good. So 2 Timothy says this. Remember what you were taught from your childhood and from the Holy Scrolls, which were imparted to you wisdom to experience the everlasting life through the faith of Jesus, the anointed one. Come on, he's anointed and his word is anointed. Every scripture has been written by the Holy Spirit, the breath of God. It will empower you to be instru the instruction and correction, giving you strength to take the right direction and to lead you deeper into the path of godliness. And <clears throat> then you will be God's servant, fully mature and perfectly prepared to fulfill any assignment that God gives you. Listen, God's never going to give you an assignment that he's not going to equip you for. But you can't sit on your backside and say, God, equip me. My daddy always said, God doesn't ever anoint an empty head. <laughs> when you want to be anointed in purpose and used by God, the first place you go is his word. His word becomes a mirror to you. You start seeing who God created you to be. Then he starts building in you and he starts creating in you. He starts instructing you and he even corrects you through his word. And those corrections lead you on a path that, that, to fulfill the purpose that God has created in your life. So good. So good. Number five, prayer. We love prayer. We're, this is a house of prayer. On Monday nights, every Monday night, we've had this for several years, five or six years now. On every Monday night, we're here praying. Most of the t we've only canceled a few times because of, of bad weather. We didn't want people uh, it, uh, caught up in bad weather. But for the most part, even holidays, Monday night here, there's going to be 20, 30, 40 people here crying out to God, praying and praying over our city, praying over our region, praying over our state, praying over our nation and all the nations of the world. We believe that God has called us to a place of prayer and that this house is called for prayer. So, uh, Prayer is more than us talking to God, though. 
Prayer is a dialogue and a conversation with God. And God is talking to us as well. And we trust and believe God is speaking to us through uh, out the day in, in many different kinds of ways. And Jesus taught us to pray. He said in the scripture, he taught us to pray. And he said, when you pray, not if you pray. He said, when you pray. Come on, somebody. So it was kind of like when you pray or when you fast. Uh, do this unto me. And so Matthew 21 says, my dwelling place will be known as a house of prayer. I said this just a minute ago. We are the dwelling place of God. Th this is not the dwelling place of God, although it's pretty rich and thick in here. But th th uh, this is the dwelling place of God. And he said, my house shall be a house of prayer. Well, our life should be a life of prayer. Amen? Amen. But we need to learn, and I, I focused a little bit on these scriptures, on hearing God's voice, not only talking to God, but listening to God. John 10 says this, my sheep hear my voice, and I know them, and they follow me, and I give them eternal life, and they will never perish, and no one will snatch them out of my hand. Matthew 4 says this, but he answered, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word out of the mouth of God. I want you to hear me this morning. I want you to hear me. God wants to speak to you. God wants to speak to you. God doesn't just speak to the pastor or the leaders in this house. God wants to speak to every individual in this place. God longs to have a relationship with you that all throughout the day, he's speaking to your heart. He's talking to you. He's sharing his love with you. He's sharing, he's sharing his heart with you, and he's leading you and guides you. Let's stop for a minute and give God some praise right now. God, you are so good, so good, so good. Number six, supernatural. Everybody say supernatural. supernatural. We live in a supernatural world. We live in a supernatural world. We believe in the power of the supernatural and that there is nothing that is impossible with God. If Jesus is here, anything can happen. There is not a person or a situation that God does not have the ability to heal, to set free, or deliver, and to bring complete restoration. And we, we as believers have been given the promise that these signs shall follow them that believe. We don't go seeking a sign, but we do understand that because we are believers and because we have a heart after God and because God loves us, that signs and wonders shall follow the believers. I read an imp a really important thing this week that talked about everybody. You know, we talk about people in full-time ministry. Listen, if you are saved, you're called into full-time ministry. Can I get one amen? amen. If, you, if you're saved, you're called into full-time ministry. Your life is a life of ministry. And, and, and if you want to be fully effective in your life of ministry, then you need to live in the realm of and understand the power of the supernatural. Because I can't do it within my own strength, but with the power of the Lord and with the grace of the Lord and with the word of the Lord and through prayer and relationship with him, I live in a supernatural realm where I operate in a supernatural way. And so when I see people on the street, I don't need to tell them, hey, listen, if you'll come to my church next Sunday, God will heal you. I can pray for them right there and God can heal them in the grocery store. I have the gospel that's burning inside of me. And I tell people uh, about what Jesus has done in my life. You say, well, I'm not a preacher. You don't need to be a preacher. Matter of fact, my greatest sermon is not a sermon. My greatest sermon is my message of what God has done in my life. And nobody can tell that story like I can. You, you might can even go tell my story because you've heard it a few times. But it does not have the full effect of like when I testify. The Bible, Bible says we're overcomers by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. But when I live in a supernatural realm, the Lord just uses that to heal people's life, to transform people people's life and so I constantly live in this world but not of this world because I'm living in the realm of the supernatural does that make sense to everybody yes. awesome so John 14 did I read that yet I tell you this timeless truth the person who follows me in faith believing in me would do the same mighty miracles that I do even greater miracles than this because I go to be with my father for I will do whatever for I will do whatever you ask me to do when you ask me in my name. And that is how the Son will show what the Father is really like and bringing glory to him. Ask me anything in my name and I will do it for you. Ask me anything and I will do it for you. When we leave out of this place today, 
We're going into the mission field, and we carry the name of Jesus. We've been sealed with the promise of God, and we can use that name. We have authority in that name, and we can walk into any situation, and we can speak the name of Jesus, and I believe miracles will happen. Number seven, the kingdom, the kingdom of God. His kingdom coming to earth. We really believe that God desires for his kingdom to come to earth. Oftentimes, as growing up in church, I always heard a lot of message about us being raptured, taken out, and going to heaven to be in the kingdom of God. It's, and I realized really now that really what really is more important than me being raptured out and going to heaven, although I really want to go to heaven, by the way, I think it's more important that while I'm here on this earth that I pull kingdom to heaven down. That I pull all the promises of God down and that I live in this kingdom realm while I'm here on this earth. Can I get a better amen? So we believe that we're in this world, but we're not of this world. And we live from a totally different perspective. We see from a heavenly place. So while all the world around us is talking about whatever's bad, we see Jesus in the midst of it all. And we see the purpose of God in the midst of it all. And we believe whatever God has already declared in heaven we can declare here on earth. If Jesus said it, if God has declared it, then we can pull that down from heaven and declare it here on this earth. Can I get a better amen? Matthew 6 says this, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, how would be thy name? Thy kingdom come and thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I want to stop for just a moment and I want to declare and I want you to declare over your life that I'm going to bring heaven to earth. I'm going to declare the promises of God, healing, miracles, signs and wonders, deliverance, power, authority. I'm declaring that. I'm saying, God, your kingdom here on earth. Enemy, you can't have my family. You can't have my church. You can't have my city. You can't have my nation. God, we're declaring your promises that you've already promised over us here on earth. Can we do that right now? Come on, let's just declare that over your life right now. I'm believing God for that. I'm believing God for that. Praise God. Let me just say this. Jay is in the house today, but I'm going to tell you, listen, there's not a politician. There's not a governor, a mayor, president, senator, or whatever else, sheriff, whoever. None of those have the authority like the church has authority. Can I take a minute and just preach a little bit right here? Don't complain about the government and what they're not doing if you're not praying and declaring kingdom over earth. Don't talk about how bad the president is if you haven't prayed for him today. Don't talk about the local government if you haven't interceded for them today. If you haven't declared Kevin's kingdom on this earth, you know what? You don't have any room to talk because you care the greatest authority there is. The church the church, the church is the greatest authority. Because why? Because we are God's kids. And so we should be doing this every day. Just a little break there. Just a little preach for a moment. Matthew 10, 7 says, And proclaim as you go, saying, The kingdom of heaven is at hand. Watch this. Heal the sick. Raise the dead. Cleanse the leopard. And cast out demons. Well, man, we don't know. Did you say demons? Oof. Oh, don't talk about them demons now. Let me tell you something. I'm not going to get into all this because I'm going to preach it next week. But listen, we need to go cast out some demons. We need to take the land back. Matter of fact, we need to take the church back. Because the devil comes to church. <laughs> she said and we bring him amen <laughs> we need to get some devils out of our lives matter of fact i'm just going to tee up next sunday real quick you know there's a lot of people that think well i'm saved so i don't have any problems no, no demons no oppression i'm going to help you understand that you could be fully saved and oppressed by the enemy but you don't have to be but you don't have to be you can walk in full authority and full freedom and full peace and fully healed by the power of God. I'm not just trying to get to heaven. I'm trying to bring Kevin's kingdom right here on earth. I don't want to just, hey, I don't want to live my life in hell trying to get to heaven. I want to live my life in heavenly places on my way to heaven. I better get on. I'll get to preaching. 
Hallelujah. Number eight, honor. Honor is the ability to see the goodness of God in people's lives and to celebrate who they are in Christ, not judge their shortcomings. To love unconditionally as we have been loved by God and to encourage and support and to honor people. My dad would say many times, he said, people, find, uh, people look at others' lives like it's a rainbow, and at the end of it, they're trying to find their faults instead of their gold. I want to look at people's life as a rainbow and at the end find the gold. See the colors that God made them. See the beauty that he's put over them. And then go refine the gold that's in them. How do I do that? I don't look at their shortcomings and their brokenness in the places are. If I need to do that, I, need, I have a bathroom with a big old mirror. And I need to stop right there. I can get all that I need to do. But I need to go and look at people's life and refine the goodness that God has put in them. And when I, while I operate in the realm of the supernatural and I look at people, the Lord starts showing me the goodness of God in their life. And those are the things we speak over people's life. And we speak about the power of God and the power of resurrection in their life and the goodness of his spirit. You know, we we find the goodness in the gold and we honor them we honor them we love to be a house of honor the bible says give honor where honor is due if someone does well come on you did good matter of fact i want to honor this church right now i just thought about this you see this beautiful guitar up here and we got another one on the way for isaac because this church loves and we love big someone decided they wanted to take these guys guitars but you know what we bless them better than they had before because you love and you honor come on and i'm thanking you today for giving of your hard-earned money your hard-earned money and we honor we honor not just with our finances we honor with our words we honor with our time we honor with our talent amen 2 Corinthians 5 says this, So then, from now on, we have a new perspective that refuses to elevate people merely by their outward appearance. Evaluate, sorry. For that's how we once viewed the anointed one. But no longer do we see him with limited human insight. No longer do we look at someone with just our eyes. I'm so thankful for that because you know what? I need that in my life. I know you don't, but I do. Now, if anyone is enfolded into Christ, he has become an entirely new creation. And all that is related to the old order has vanished. Behold, everything is fresh in you. Come on, fresh. Look at your neighbor and say, you fresh. <laughs> and God has made all things new and reconciled us to himself and has given us the ministry of reconciliation reconciling others to God this house believes that people come here broken and it's our responsibility it's our responsibility to help them become who God created them to be and so we want to walk with people and the way we do that is we honor them we love them for who God created them to be even though we may see the struggles in their life we know that God has a plan and a purpose for life number nine generosity is the heart of serving others serving is the heart of Jesus and he said I came to serve not to be served I'm gonna tell you we live in a world today that's give me 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 and then give me a little bit more they got their hands out their hearts closed and they just want we live in a want society. The church are to be the leaders in a serving society. We are to be the people that serve everybody and we give generously and we have a spirit of generosity. And we're willing to love the unlovable and, and give them of our time. Everybody say, my time. You know what? I remember a day when you were able to get people's time because they didn't have a whole lot of treasure. But today I found out that people will write you a check as long as you don't require anything of them. Right. Let me tell you something. You can give your money and it be an escape for you not to give your heart. Right. When you start serving people, let me tell you. Ooh, I feel the Holy Spirit up here. When you, if you got something broke in your life, quit crying about your brokenness and go serve others. Yes. It's a supernatural healing. When you start serving other people, something amazing happens in your life. All of a sudden, you get your eyes off of your problems, and you start seeing Jesus, and, you, and Jesus starts healing you while you serve others. 
That's a good word. It wasn't in my notes, but it's a good word. And when we have the spirit of generosity, we are willing to love the unlovable and give to them not just our time, but of our talent and our treasure. And it makes others better. Acts 20 says this, <clears throat> And he left you an example of how you should serve and to take care of those who are weak. For we must always cherish the words of our Lord Jesus who taught, Giving brings us far greater blessing than receiving. Giving get, brings us far greater blessing Amen. than receiving. Yeah. I don't want you to just do this in church. I want you to do this on your job. I want you to look around you. Maybe there's a single mom on your job, and you know that she's struggling to, to get her kids a backpack and get them some clothes for school. I don't want it to be a church program that you rise up to and say, well, pastor said for us to, to do this, but I want you to start living out of a life of generosity and asking God to give you his eyes to see, his heart to love, and then you just bless them with nothing in return, not even a thank you, because you know what? You're doing his unto the Lord, and he's going to bless you greater than you can even imagine. Right. Come on, that's good. Matthew 25 says the king will answer them, Don't you know that when you care for the one of the least important of these, my little ones, my true brothers and sisters, you have demonstrated your love for me. When you, when you bless someone, you know what you said? God loves me, and so I'm going to love you because I need God's love. Last but not least, Heather, you can come. Number 10. God has called us to live a life of freedom and to walk in the fullness of his joy, and he wants us to live abundantly. Yes. Everybody say more. more. Come on. I want to stop right here and pray. I break every spirit of poverty off of our life. I lose laughter and fun on our life. I lose the joy of the Lord on our life. I lose blessings over our life. Lord, you've called us to be the head and not the tail. And we're more than enough. You're a good God. Proverbs 17 says this, A joyful, cheerful heart brings healing to both the body and the soul. But the one whose heart is crushed struggles with sickness and depression. God wants you to have a great heart. If you're struggling with sickness and depression, maybe you haven't learned how to have fun. Maybe you haven't learned how to live in the goodness of God. Maybe you haven't learned how to let the joy of the Lord be your light. The Bible says laughter is good like a medicine. Those who live a spirit-filled life are to be the funnest people on earth. Ain't nobody can have fun. Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party. And the Holy Ghost party don't stop. Ain't no party like a Holy Ghost party, and the Holy Ghost party don't stop. I don't have a hangover in the morning. My friends are not just farewell friends at the bar. It's good. I can laugh at the devil. Come on, somebody or just laugh at the devil right now. Just laugh at him. He's got so many people messed up, depressed, down and out, struggling. But look at us. <laughs> we're drunk yeah. on the new wine, and we're having a party. Yeah. <laughs> and we're going to have fun. Yeah. I remember growing up in church, a little lady would stand up and testify, or, and she'd say, well, praise the Lord. <laughs> it's just no fun out there in the world. Drinking and going to bars. I thank God for delivering me from that. Well, I'm just going to be honest with you. You know what? I had some fun in some bars. <laughs> I did. I had some good times. I, I used to like to dance a little bit. <laughs> and nobody wanted to dance with me. That's all right. I danced with myself. <laughs> mm-hmm. Somebody said, you got good moves. I said, they mine. <laughs> I like them. But then I'd wake up the next day, and I'd be lost, struggling, trying to figure out where to go, what to do, what's next in my life. You know what? I'm still dancing, and sometimes with myself. But there's one thing I know for sure. 
that this fun that I'm having, there's nothing in this world that can even touch it. There, there, there is no, no expression of how much fun that I have living for God. And when you learn to live in the freedom of God and the purpose of God and the plan of God and get out of our little religious duty walls that we have to live in, that we, we sometimes told to live in. Listen, you know what grace does? Grace helps you to laugh at the enemy. Grace helps you to walk in the fullness of God. Grace gives you the liberty to be above and not beneath. And when you walk in that liberty and that grace of God, there is no fun on earth that can match it. And I'm still dancing. I still like to have fun. I still like, like today, I, can't hardly, I couldn't hardly wait for today. Because we're about to go outside, and we're going to throw down. We're going to eat tacos, and we're gonna, the kids are going to slide on slides, and, and we're going to dunk Angela like a bunch of times. And it's going to be so fun. But you know the funnest part about this? Is I get to hang out with you. Amen. And I get to be with my family. Amen. And I get up to get up tomorrow rejoicing in the goodness of God. And I take pleasure in his presence. Because he's always good. He's always faithful. And he will never leave us. He will never forsake us. Stand with me this morning. So if the enemy's told you something different than that, I want you right now, seriously, I want you to laugh at the enemy right now. Come on, just laugh at him. Come on, can you just laugh? Like, ha, 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 I'm the winner, not the, ha, ha. Who gets the last laugh? I do. Somebody told me this week, said, you're always having fun. I said, well, why not? Right. <laughs> well, why shouldn't I be? Living for God is fun. Yeah. It's a joy. Right. It's not work. I've heard people get up and preach, living for God is hard. Well, that's because you ain't having fun, Jack. That's right. Living for God is easy when you understand his grace, and his mercy, his kindness, under knowing that you're free. And sometimes we're in the middle of a fight with the enemy. And we think the enemy's attacking us. It's really the devil don't like us having fun and attacking him. He's trying to fight back. We need to learn to laugh at the devil. And say, hey, I'm redeemed, buddy. You can do what you want to do. I'm free. All my sins are gone. I don't have any sin. They were all hung on the cross. My past is behind me. My future's ahead of me. And I'm on the winning team. How fun is that? How fun is that to be on the winning team? So I want you to leave here today. Don't just, don't just be a Christian. Be the funnest person on the planet. Be the funnest person at work. Be the funnest person. Be the funnest person to be around. Be radiant with God's goodness and his mercy. And don't let situations around you determine your happiness. I don't want you to raise your hand today, but there's been days that I've been broke. How many's ever been broke? Oh, man, man, y'all should be giving big. No, only half of y'all has ever been broke. Let's take up another offering. There's plenty of money in here. How many's ever been broke? How many's ever been brokenhearted? You know what? In the midst of being broke or brokenhearted, God's love bank never drains out. It never goes away. I've been to the ATM machine and it spit that little piece of paper and say, sucker, you broke. <laughs> Come back after you make a deposit. <laughs> but with the Lord, he just keeps on blessing me and blessing me and blessing me. Because I've decided just look, I'm all in. I'm 100%. I'm 100%. Bow your heads.
Father God, we thank you, Lord, for these core values today, the things that guide and direct and lead our life. Today, we don't want this just to be another sermon or another message spoken, Lord, but we want to apply these core values to our life and to our house, to this house, so that we can fully affect our lives and it can fully affect the kingdom of God. It can fully change the city. That our love will be your love and it will be poured out over this city, Lord, and over the places that we live, God, all down this I-12 corridor that you've called us to, God. That we can be world changers and that we, we become so so attractional, God, that people want to hang out with us. They want to know what we've got. They want to be at our, our they want to be a part of this blessing that you're pouring out because, God, we have set some goals and some guidelines and some, and some core values in our life, and we know our purpose and our plan. Amen. And so we know what you created us for, God, and we want to fulfill that to its greatest potential. We love you. We thank you because you are good, you're faithful, and you care about us. And so let us go love the world like you've loved us. In Jesus' name I pray. And everybody said amen. Amen. amen.